Assalamualaikum Sayyidi Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah What to do when you don't understand the guidance of the shaykh towards the decision you have to take? What was that again? What to do when you don't understand the guidance of the shaykh toward a decision you have to take? InshaAllah, <coughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Rahim. If we don't understand the guidance from the shaykh according to a decision we have to make, most likely the, the understanding and all the emails that are coming in, there's a misconception on the shaykh and the, the role of the shaykh and how to develop a relationship with the shaykh. And that's what's most important is that I'm coming to association for I think in Western understanding a life coach in a subcontinent can be many misunderstandings. As soon as we say shaykh, peer, we've gone places you say shaykh and they say, oh they don't respect you if you say shaykh, shaykh. You have to call yourself peer, <laughs> then they say, oh peer, now we know what to do with him because he's a peer. But so there's all these preconceptions, misunderstandings in, in the world with, with words. And for Naqshbandiya and in these days it's a somebody who will inspire you towards what Allah wants for you. And He is never competing with Allah Allah send you bala, He is not taking it away. Allah send you testing, He doesn't take it away because Allah mentions those type of people in Qur'an that, don't try to find any wali who can save you from me. And those are the ayahs that the Wahhabis refer to and say, say, oh look, look you don't have to have a wali. So no, those people whom are acting like a saintly character, acting like guides and they inspire people come to us, we save you from Allah. If, if bad coming to you we take it away, if no rizq coming to you we give to you. And they're like in a competition stuff Allah, which Allah has no competition but in their small minds they may feel they have the ability to do that, that's not Naqshbandi guidance. Also not a fall where you draw sticks and charms where they say, yeah I, I want to get married, here are three names, Shaykh which one is the one that will be it? They don't make the decisions in life of where you're going to work, what school you're going to go to, who you're supposed to marry, that's not a shaykh's choice, that's your life choices because you make the wrong one and you get to live with it. So they're not here to take our test in life but here to inspire us, did you meditate? Did you do your zikr? Are you doing your salawats? Are you sitting on these carpets and, and doing the, the nasheeds and the, the khatams and, the, and all of these programs? Are you watching the videos? Because most likely a lot of these questions came in the last three weeks of videos. And you'd be surprised that the emails that come in and the questions that come in as if they didn't watch the video because some people are too busy trying to to say something and not really learn something. So the shaykhs of Naqshbandiya, Haqqani and Shaykh Nazim's way as was taught by us by our shaykhs is, no we're not here to take anyone's path and not make anyone's decisions and they're not at that level to even receive a command from the shaykh that you do this. So everything is by talks, so they'll inspire you in a letter that here are some videos, watch these videos. If you're clever enough you should pick up the understanding for you because when the student is not at that level of he's at a level of being ready, anything you tell them they will go back and repeat it in their mind that you've misguided them, you've told them something they, they, they can't do, they don't want to do, they don't want to listen to what you just said to do and that's where the great confusion. You'll lose many students by trying to give them an exact coordinates. You buy a, buy a brown car and work over there, 
Oh, they fight you left and right. You walk by one person and say, eat some chocolate and he becomes so angry that, why you told me to eat chocolate? I don't like chocolate because now the nafs will start to interfere with you and the shaykh. So they know that shaitan is playing with people and that's why their guidance is, is never in a direct fashion and there are very few who can take direct guidance and they're in danger of receiving direct guidance and not listening. So they don't do that. So at the beginning level and 99% of all the people at that level it's basically you'll get a response. You'll get some videos that you should watch to understand and the foundation of your, of your path is in meditation. You should be connecting with the shaykh, connecting with the energy, sitting there and opening your heart for inspiration so that the inspiration comes to you what your choice should be because it's your path and that you have to make that choice. So then everything that's being given is for you to make that choice. All 1,200 or 1,200 videos, good God through those videos you must have an answer for everything. Every subject under the sun has been talked in these videos. There's nothing anyone has ever questioned or emailed that was like new. You know humanity there's nothing new, everything repeats like fashion. Every five years, seven years it's the same thing, same, same issues are coming up in life. So you'll find it in a video, you'll find it in our emails that come back and tell you to meditate and contemplate and make your connection, work on your anger, make sure you have your taweez and then build the relationship. And we just recently posted something on hidayat and hibah. Those whom have been in proximity with the shaykhs and all their life lived around shaykhs that Prophet described the gift giving. That giving gift, hidayah, hidayah, hidya, hidayah, hidayah, now hidayah is guidance, hadiyah, hadiyah and hiba, giving a gift. It's not charity, don't confuse charity. Charity we all owe from the money that we make, we owe to those who are less fortunate. So then all accounts for us, this money you've made give to those less fortunate, to your families, to the people in need and those are the charity organizations that were established so that this rizq we have has to go to the poor. A percentage of everything we own has to go to the poor and tariqah is not at zakat of 2.5, tariqah upholds the level of khums which is one-fifth and during the time of Sahabi whatever they achieved in battles, whatever they achieved of rizq they brought one-fifth of that to the presence of Sayyidina Muhammad So tariqah upholds the highest level, not, not the end, they don't teach you the highest level and you keep the lowest level of all of the fiqh. So khums and, and what you owe from uh, of what you achieved to back towards Allah at least one-fifth, at least. So most of the students of the tariqah are giving 10%, 15%, 20% and this is a sense of purity, this is the way of the tariqah, this is of the way of the highest levels. You know if you look at our awrad and our salah, we don't pray five times a day, we keep the azimah of when Sayyidina Muhammad went into Divinely Presence and came back to Sayyidina Musa and said, what are the order for your nation? He said, 50, 50 salah a day. And Nabi Musa told Prophet this is too heavy, your nation won't keep it. Well Nashwandi keeps the 50. If you count and go through our awrad, we're praying 50 times. 50 rakahs a day with your tahajjud, with your tasbih, with your shukr, with everything that in the fajr all right. So tariqah comes to teach that you keep the highest level, we don't keep the lowest level, we're teaching, we're teaching at the highest level and we try to adhere to the highest level. But in far as the relationship, hidayah, hadiyah and hiba is gift giving. That when you give a gift to the shaykh you're building familiar relationships and that's why Prophet encouraged, give gifts, it encourages a love and a bond with people. When you give them a gift your responsibility is to give an equal 
or better gift back. So when you give a gift to somebody, you're showing and building a bond of relationship. So even amongst yourselves you bring an atif for somebody, it's a sign that, I appreciate you and all that you do and that I'm always thinking of you. And then Prophet was teaching that you give back. So what do awliya and guides give back? The best of what they have, what they're going to give you back, a bottle of perfume? They're going to give you back their du'a, their nazar, their heart that you thought about us and we're thinking about you. And the best of what they have to give, they give to you which is their du'a, their heart, in their heart that they're thanking Allah that these people are doing and adhering, these people are thinking of us, they're remembering us, they're praying for us. That when you're conscious of the one that you love and that what their condition may be, what are they in need of, I want to show them my love and my appreciation. Of course this builds a, a, a bond, a familiarity. Familiarity means that it builds like a family relationship. When we say something is familiar, it's from family, its root is from family. So when a community comes together, they become like a family. Where the shaykh becomes a central figure in their lives of guidance and direction. So of course then the student wants to show their love and appreciation. That's how then they're building now the connection, these are the tools. You came, I'm listening, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the awrad, I have the app, I'm now interacting and emailing. And then of course I'm supporting, I'm doing all these things to show my love. Of course the shaykh is reciprocating that through his Heart. The other person is coming, this person is trying, this person is thinking of us except our prayer for them because they do and that we're asking and Allah then becomes and granting, yes that person is thinking of you and that person is doing all of these things and I will accept that du'a. So these are, these are all tools that the tariqahs came to give the best of examples and anyone can go back and now search uh, hadiyah and hibah. The people who, who had property they were giving to Prophet they were giving gifts and atars and, and uh, camels and whatever they were giving and Prophet was using for his community, for his family, however it was needed. But this built the relationship of a loving bond and built the generosity and the characteristics of heavenly people in which they are, they are, they are opening their heart for all of these realities and then to be dressed and blessed by these realities. That's, that's the important step because then the person feels connected. When they feel connected and they're doing their practices then their inspirations are coming. So there's a big difference that when somebody is doing charitable things, alhamdulillah that's what Allah wanted from them. And then they're doing things from a state of love in which they're showing their appreciation and their love. The shaykh is not eating from the charity. So that is an important step in the tariqah and it builds the bond with all these other questions that people are asking, who's my shaykh? You're listening to the shaykh and asking who's my shaykh? I don't know, if you, if, if, if you don't know by now then good luck for you. So a lot of these things, these are all tools, if you don't use these tools then they're just a you know, beautiful set of uh, gifts that Allah has given and people don't use them. But it should begin to feel and to be motivated and, and all the energy of everything to be opening when we use all of these tools, inshaAllah. As Salaamu Alaykum Ya Sayyidi Wa Alaykum As Salaam wa When a person is given a punishment for a certain time or certain situation for his or her deeds, is there a way to reduce it? Please forgive my ignorance. When a person is being punished for a certain period of time, is, is there a way to reduce the punishment? Yeah, everything, everything we do is meant to reduce any form of dissatisfaction from Allah that for servant to know that they're under punishment or testing is very difficult. That sometimes somebody can look at their life and believe it to be a punishment 
when in reality it's Allah testing the servant and that Allah only wants the best for the servant and they may have made wrong choices and therefore the test became very severe and very difficult. That's why again what we just described relieves all of that. So anyone who builds a relationship with the shaykhs, builds a very close familiarity with the shaykhs or, or making them the central point in their lives, doing the awrah, doing the zikr, listening to the talks, reading all the articles, it's, it overwhelms you with a Muhammadan light. Then what Prophet described, what Allah described in Holy Qur'an, we would not punish them while you are with them and they're asking for forgiveness, it's Qur'an. So Allah's Divinely ancient holy words which is no one should doubt, Allah is telling the people, how, I gonna, how am I going to punish them when the presence of Sayyidina Muhammad is there amongst you, with you in you and all about you and you're making istighfar. So if you feel a punishment, how could you be punished if you are doing the meditation, listening to the salawats and, and keeping the love of Sayyidina Muhammad giving the gifts, meditating, feeding the light, how Allah would punish you for that? And how could punishment even come close to you and you're making istighfar and you're making salawat? Then the rest is just hardship in life, testing and testing and testing and you try to pass those testing. So if we don't have that presence then we can be a little bit scared, no I don't feel the presence of Prophet no I'm not meditating and no not really com com sort of supporting and involved like that to support and, and uh, I don't know if I do the practices yet then it can be very scary. And that's why the tariqah comes to show again all these tools. If you do it and you sort of continue and firm with it, you should feel a completely different reality. You should feel the love of Prophet and that whatever test comes, alhamdulillah. Many people have, have understood the shaykh's lives like a car that had been flipped over a mountainside and the car just spinning. <laughs> But the shaykh just sitting there as if the whole world is crashing all around but Allah keep him firm in his way because life is filled with testing. But when they have that love with their practices and with their connection the whole world can crush and that's what, قُلْ يَا نَهْرُ كُونِ بَعْدًا وَالسَّلَامًا عَلَىٰ Ibrahim. That Allah say, I'll throw you into a fire but for you it's going to be very cool and peaceful. Because they know that when Allah was testing in, in that level of testing there was an immense tranquility and peace because the love of Sayyidina Muhammad emanates and dresses them and blesses them that everything is going to be okay. So these are all the tools that we need for the difficulties that are opening inshaAllah. Uh, as Alaikum Sayyidi. Walaykum as salaam wa rahmatullah. When doing muhasaba, when doing muhasaba, not sins, but how could we show better adab? How reliable is the voice that is advising, or does istighfar suffice? Well, when we're doing muhasaba, uh, when doing muhasaba of not sins, but how we could have better adab? How reliable is the voice that is advising us? Does it? Does istighfar suffice? When we do an accounting of ourselves and thinking of our adab, how does the… Or, or do we trust the voice that tells us about our adab? Yeah, I don't know, I don't know, I, 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 the voice, you shouldn't hear any voices. That's one thing, there's no voice coming through. This is a consciousness within the heart that when we meditate and, and we talk about adab like how I should behave and how I should act, I should have educated myself on the adab. So we don't just make it up. So I, if I'm looking on adab, I'll go to the playlist of videos on adab, tariqah adab, adab of the shaykh, adab with the shaykh, adab with people, adab, you study it. So that you learn what is the adab 
Then you sit and meditate that, Ya Rabbi give me like the adab that my shaykh has taught to me. What should my be my adab with Allah is that I love Allah but I should be sitting at the door of Prophet What is the adab with Prophet that I love Sayyidina Muhammad I adhere to the sunnah and I love his family, love his companions and I try to have the best of character and I find his living guides. So each of those are teaching us adab then I watch all those videos on that reality. And then how's my adab now with my living guide? That these are the representatives of Sayyidina Muhammad How I conduct myself, that's why then all of these teachings were so important. How you conduct yourself with them, how you talk with them, how you deal with them. So then you study the subject before you sit and just meditate and make up through your mind you know an imagination and imaginal adab that may not have any basis in Islamic understanding and any of the tariqah teachings. So it's important to educate ourselves on the subject then sit and meditate on it. I want to know like the principles of faith, I watch the playlist then I sit and meditate for those understandings. I want to understand energy, I don't just sit and meditate and make up my understanding of energy and say, oh this is similar to Reiki and oh this is similar to the Buddhas and this is similar… No, that I study the list from the shaykh of the Muhammadan haqqaiqs of energy and, and realities of energy and then when I sit and I ask from what the shaykh taught me, I want to reach that energy. So it's very specific. Otherwise it could be just a soup of imagination and mixed with many different things. There's somebody and many people emailing that they were secluding themselves and then they, they, when they come out of the seclusion amongst people they're facing all sorts of difficulties. There was no permission for anyone to seclude themselves. There's absolutely no permission for seclusion. So that's something you were doing on your own without a permission you can go mentally crazy from something like that. That something that is not authorized, not guided and not by permission of Sayyidina Muhammad and just thinking that, oh the, the shaykh's teaching for me just to isolate and always stay by myself. No, that's how many people go crazy. They sit by themselves, they're not that type of person, they're not been authorized for that. And who else may be in that room? Because you may not have very good meditation skills, you're not calling the madad correctly and shaitan just sitting right there until he goes into the person and possess them. So these are not things people just you do your own on your own. Our way is qalwa dar anjuman, so it's under the principles from Mawlana Shah Naqshaban. I took a path of seclusion amongst the people which we said before, they'll send you to a candy store and you love candy. So the test is, is if you love candy is not to, to go where you know everything is salty. And so, oh, I'm, a, I'm a big accomplishment, I'm sitting in a salt store. But you love sweets, so they'll send you to the candy store and you practice not touching the candy. So it means that the real test is to be amongst people, not hiding because if you're a person who likes to hide that's your natural inclination is to hide. So then the test amongst people is that people have to work, they go out to work. They do the practices they have to do but then they adhere to how the shaykh taught them, they look to your feet, keep with your zikr, keep your tasbih in your hand and keep remembering Allah Make sure that you washed before you left, you kept your wudu and everything that you had to do. And then when you interacted with people you kept your energies and then when you go home you washed those energies. So everything to you know has to be through the guidance and through the understanding. But if somebody just decides that, oh because of energy I don't want to see anyone anymore and I'm just going to lock myself up, that's very dangerous and that's not a part of the guidance. So we educate ourselves first and then from what we educated ourselves, now I want to learn about this and I begin to meditate on how to understand that reality. Its basis has to be from what you learned. Because you don't receive wahi, you don't sit on a subject you don't know and Allah reveals to you. That's wahi and that's for the Prophets of Allah You receive ilham, so you have to know something and Allah will expand it and through the reality of ilham and, ex and expanding the heart is that you read your alif ba, understood the alif ba. 
you understood that section and then you meditate on it, Allah will send an angel to inspire your heart to expand upon it. But don't just sit on, on something you don't know and Allah will from beginning, it's not like that, that's not the adab, inshaAllah. As salaamu Sayyidi Walaykum As salaam wa rahmatullah. When you realize you're facing a test and you make your mind to do the right thing, but when faced with the actual moment, you end up acting with a lot of anger. What should you do? That when you're facing a test and you know what the right thing should be, but in an instant you enter into anger, and most likely you lost your test. Yeah, this is the, the difficulty that I think the last three weeks of videos are coming out to show. And these are the last probably seven months or a year that whatever's happening on this earth with these pandemics, these plagues, whatever these things are, is going to increase the level of anger on earth. The shayateen that are outside are entering inside and without an in on fire then everybody's biggest test is qadab and anger and surviving anger so that they can be with Sayyidina Mahdi salam and not with the dajjal and that the anger is going to lead people towards the way of dajjal and that his people are angry, violent and outright dangerous. That's the importance. So again the tools that have been taught, keep the wudu, keep the practices, make sure that you have your connection, that you're doing your tafakkur, that you're asking for that energy to come and that you're conscious of the test that you're trying to work on. When you know that your character, you have to have an external reminder for your test. Otherwise every time it just happens and then you didn't pass it. So you say, I'm going to work on anger, I'm going to put something on my hand as a reminder. So as soon as I'm about to get angry I look at that, that this is my test, I'm supposed to pass this. I'll go make my wudu, I'll put my lollipop in my mouth so I just don't say anything because I know I'm going to say something in about two seconds. And, and so you, you give all these tools that have been given to us so that we can pass it. And as soon as Allah sees that the servant is trying to work on it and work on it, then this is what إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ When Allah says, we send support, that's what He wants to see, are you fighting the devils or are you joining them? So that's, that's the importance is that when I take a path in which I want to fight them and I want to you know, use my practices, use what I've been told, ask for the madad, ask for all of these things, Allah begin to send the support for the servant so that they can endure more, they become stronger, they become stronger until they become victorious over these characteristics. And that Allah's support is, is a mighty support that surrounds the servants whom Allah granted His, His grace and His favours upon them. As Salaamu Alaikum Shaykh Nurjan Walaykum As Salaam wa rahmatullah How do one express empathy towards someone he does not like? Would it be not considered as hypocrisy? How does one express empathy? to one whom they don't like, would it be a form of hypocrisy? Yeah. Hypocrisy is a… is to… and the, the depth of hypocrisy is in which you truly act as if you love someone, you like them sincerely, you're trying to be around them, have a relationship with them but a, a rancor and a hatred within the heart that in a moment's notice you hate them and everything in your heart truly comes out about how you dislike the person. But you kept the facade of trying to be… Yeah, loving with them, close with them, dear with them. And this was the danger that Prophet faced within the nation as those whom claim to be with him be a part of the nation, be a part of Islam but their purpose there was to destroy 
everything from the nation of Islam. And that was the greater danger of the one inside was more dangerous than the enemy outside. So that's different than having good characteristics and being cordial, being polite but you're not trying to embrace the person, love the person. If there's a person that something about them that is not correct, correct to you and not of a correct nature to you, still one can be polite, be gracious but doesn't have to embrace them as best friends and now pretend to be something that you're not with them. If there's something wrong with a person and the heart just is not wanting to be in the company or their actions are not correct and the things they do, then it's just a state of being polite and gracious but not trying to, to fake your friendship and, and to be around them all the time. And then yes, you would be in a continuous state of, of lying to yourself and pretending that you're, you're of a nature that you are not of that nature. So it's important that there's a thin line in the difference of being gracious to someone that uh, just is, is not of a nature that you want to be around versus being rude to them. So you don't have to, to be rude for someone that you don't like, you don't have to be aggressive against them just because you don't like what they do, you avoid them, inshaAllah. Mm. Uh, when shaykh spoke about energy manifesting into insects, what can be said if you get termites in the house, like repeatedly, even after treatment from a particular corner of the house? Oh, wow. Uh, Wa salam that when we talked about the negative energy manifesting into insects and difficulties, what can be said about continuous attack of termites on the house? What would that represent? Yeah, I, that's, that's hard to, to say that, that this energy is, is more important, uh, an energy around ourselves, uh, energy around the, the house as uh, you know bugs and, and difficulties and bad negative energies. But uh, termites is, is something that you know may, may be something with the wood, maybe <laughs> you know wood rot in a certain area, there may be a dampness in the house somewhere that causing these things to come. But again you, you, we have to be careful that these, these tests, these talks go out into the general public. You can't go back into your home and then say, oh my god there's like a cockroach in there, what does that represent? And that it's just like the energy of a cockroach coming and so these are you know big conditions. They may be attracted to a food source that you've left out, there may be rodents in a certain area because you left food that you put out a bird feeder and now all the, the rats came. Somebody actually emailed the, the problem that I had, put a, something for birds and the rats came to eat it, not the birds. So you know that's not the, that's not the spiritual talk of the rats, that's just you use better judgment and don't put their food out that they like. So again everything has to be balanced. But those are just understandings and more in, on importance of the energy talks is that the bad character, that the person has a, a character like a wasp is that they sting and they have no sweetness. You know a bee at least he stings when he feels threatened by his life because many people have bees all over them and they don't bite them. So the, the bee because his stinger is only if he feels threatened with his life he gives it and then he dies. But his wasp character is they sting many people and they don't die and they just enjoy stinging people. So waspy character are people who they just from their mouth very sharp and they hurt, just hurt and hurt from their mouth and they just go around doing that. So again it's more of this spiritual understanding. As Salaamu Sayyidi Walaykum As Salaam wa rahmatullah. How do we stop ourselves from judging others? Forgive me for my ignorance. How do we stop ourselves from judging others? Yes, inshaAllah. One has to remember that judge not for you will be judged. That the criteria in which we are judging people, Allah will judge us. And it's a, a part of the tafakkur, it's a part of the energy practices, these are all the 
ruinous traits, all the bad characteristics. When we meditate, when we contemplate, when we try to bring the positive energy in our life, we become more conscious about these characteristics. And that the concept of ju judging people and, and who's doing right and who's doing wrong, it becomes much stronger with your good practices, you'll become more aware of, of those types of characteristics in which to be more accepting of people. Because we judge them, we find them to be guilty and then we place a verdict on people. And what makes the, the shaykhs and their teachings and their zawiyahs different from other associations is because of the level of patience and tolerance they have. They try to be as patient as possible with people knowing that they're all coming from different understandings, different backgrounds and different levels of, of their practices and just tolerating and being patient and, and, and being patient until the, the student learns and, and that their characteristics to be sort of more perfected. It's important and that's a part of the, the having sabr and all the practices. When we don't have that then we just sort of render judgment on people which is the a popular attribute of the Wahhabi sect. Wahhabi sect, the Obandi sect, all of them are the same, all of them are, are, are of a nature that teach and because they don't have taskiyah and they don't have the way of perfection, they exhibit these ruinous traits. That's why their brand is dangerous, their ulama are dangerous because of these characteristics, right? These people who teach this intolerant madhab and Name all of these that you think they are, the tabligh, the uban, not naqshban, the wahhab, all these things that their, their belief system is where their flow is intolerance and that becomes a very dangerous flow. Because of their intolerance then they find everything that these people are doing are wrong. And, and that is the greatest shirk. So somebody watches our video from these groups and they say, oh this is shirk, what part of this talk was shirk? Just they learned these weird words and then they just judged everything and that was the biggest shirk, was the judging of Allah's creation, judging without knowing, without having read their articles, having gone to their websites. These, these other groups we know because in their website they curse everybody, they say everybody is a deviant, everybody has done this wrong. All of these things are shirk, they just have a, a system of judging. The danger for their students is they judge everything. Their students come to the website and say, everything is a shirk, w -w -w what are you talking about? Where, where's the dalil of what you're talking about? Where's the whole sort of proof of, of all of these things? And they don't have it, they don't produce it. So that's the danger is that if you go to a group that doesn't teach good manners, that be patient, be tolerant, perfect yourself, look at all of the inner shirk that you are doing, looking all the bad characteristics that you are doing and we should only worry about ourself and perfecting ourself. Allah is not going to ask us about these other groups and other people, He's going to ask us, what about your grave? And that's the danger. So we get emails from the people who have learned from them which is coming in every day, every day that this is this, this is this. I said, yeah, this, don't take this way of judging any of our teaching but come and learn it, read it, understand it. You'll see in the article the Qur'an is there, hadith is there for everything that we're talking about. There's a continuous reference to Qur'an, continuous reference to hadith. So come empty and learn. Because you sat with so many people who were judgmental and everything haram, everything is shirk, everything is forbidden and that was the greatest shirk, was the judging of Allah's creation and having these bad manners and bad characteristics. We pray that Allah give us a good heart, good characteristics filled with the love and muhabbat of the heavens, love and muhabbat of Sayyidina Muhammad of his beloved Ahlul Bayt and his beloved 
holy companions and awliyaullah fi samahi wa fil ard. Bi hurmati Muhammad al-Mustafa wa bi siri Surat al-Fatiha.